welcome everybody to the February 11th, 2019 joint meeting of the Planning Board and the Committee on Legislative Matters of the Northampton City Council. I'm Elisa Klein and I'm the Vice Chair of the Legislative Matters Committee and I'm presiding today because Bill White, Bill Dwight, who usually uh, chairs these meetings, the chair of the committee, is, wasn't able to be here. Um, so bear with me because I um, may kind of uh, struggle with some of the procedural things since I don't know how to do this. But um, welcome to members of the public and whoever ends up watching this once it is recorded and posted. Um, the first order of business is to do the roll call of our committee. Sure. Um, Councilor Dwight, uh, present. Uh, Councilor Klein, here. Councilor Carney, present. And Councilor Murphy, here. Um, and should we allow the planning board to do their roll call at this point? Is that? I think we don't typically do roll call, but. Um, Happy to introduce ourselves. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is George Hill. I'm Krista Granat. Alan Burson. Jana White. Thank you. Um, we need to approve the minutes of our previous meeting, January 14th, 2019. That's of the Legislative Matters Move Committee. To approve. Second. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Um, we will now conduct a public hearing on the proposed zoning change. Um, together with the planning board, uh, the planning board, and I'm going to read the legislation into the record. Um, in the year 2018, that could be a little problem, a little Scrivener's error that needs to be changed to 19 to start. Upon recommendation of the mayor and the public shade tree committee, 18.231, an ordinance relative to large-scale ground-mounted solar arrays in ordinance of the city of Northampton, Massachusetts, providing that, ch that chapter 350 code of ordinances, city of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended by modifying allowances under special permit for ground mounted solar volta voltaic arrays. Um, I just want to add that this is actually the amended version of this uh, ordinance. <coughs> in ordinance of the city, oh, we read that. Uses allowed. Use is allowed by right for all zoning districts, rooftop solar, hot water, and photovoltaic, accessory solar voltaic PV, ground mounted on a parcel with any building use, provided that the PV is sized to generate no more than 150% of the annual projected electric use of the non-PV building use, or 12 kilowatts, whichever is greater, the setbacks for such a PV shall be the same <coughs> as for detached accessory structures as set forth in the tables above. Site plan approval required for the following for all zoning districts. Solar vo voltaic of any size ground mounted shall be permitted with administrative site plan from the Office of Planning and Sustainability if one of the following is met. One, the PV array is constructed over any legal <coughs> parking lot or driveway, or two, the PV array is constructed at, at any assigned landfill site not separated from the site assigned property by any road, or three, the PV array is constructed at an airport not separated from the runway, runways by any road, and four, the power and telecommunications extensions are not visible from the public way. Site plan approval required for the following uses by planning board unless otherwise noted for RR, SR, URA, URB, WSP, um, solar voltaic, large scale ground mounted, uh, the removal of significant, am I missing something here? That sounds like an unfinished sentence. Um, well, we will get back to that as we discuss this. The removal of significant trees on the subject <coughs> parcels must be replaced in accordance with 350-12.3 and includes tree removal that occurs within 12 months immediately prior to an application for installation of such a system. Setbacks. Uh, the front would be 50 feet, side would be 50 feet, rear 50 feet, maximum height 30 feet, open space 20%. 
a planted buffer to a budding residential property shall be at least 15 feet in width along the property boundary. It shall contain a screen of plantings, a vertical habitat in the center of the strip, not less than three feet in width and six feet in height at the time of occupancy of such a lot. Individual shrubs shall be planted not more than five feet on the center, and individual trees thereafter shall be maintained by the owner or occupant so as to maintain the <coughs> screen at least 50% of the plantings shall be evenly spaced. Whenever possible, existing trees and ground cover should be preserved in this strip, reducing the need to plant additional trees. Trees may not be cut down in this strip without site plan approval. Projects resulting in more than five acres of canopy removal shall comply with one, at least 50% of the property, shall be protected from tree clearing and future development for the duration of the operation of the solar array installation, and until such time as the system is decommissioned and removed. Two, within the area beyond the first five acres of canopy removed, stumps or removed trees must remain in place, and no excavation soil disturbance is allowed other than what would be required to bore support posts for the PV panels. I will accept a, a motion to put this on the floor for discussion. Or to open, I should say, to open the public hearing. I would hearing. want to open the public hearing. Fair. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Um, that is unanimous. Uh, opening of the public hearing. So the way that we thought we would conduct this, because we have an amended version here, is we will have uh, Carolyn Mish from the planning department um, explain the amendments and changes. Um, and that will be followed by Attorney Alan Seawall, the city solicitor, who will uh, give his rationale for the amendments that he actually crafted. Um, after that, we will open up the floor for uh, public input to hear from you in response to uh, the amended version. Um, and then the planning board and the council will um, ask questions. Um, so Ms. Mish, please. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no. the, the only one that's on the floor is the one that was in the packet. This is something that is proposed to be amended. So I need to, to we need a motion to put the amended version on the floor as part people, of the public hearing. Yes. But I don't I think that there may be people here who haven't seen the prior amendments. So they don't know what we're amending from. Aha. Uh -huh. So we should leave that as well into the record. <coughs> that's what you're suggesting. Yes. Right? Okay. Is that where, that's Do we where, need to know what we are amending from? That's what that's what I'm yes, I think we do. Do we not? <laughs> yes. I mean uh, that's what that's what was published at, uh, along with the agenda was the first amendment. Oh I see. Right. And so that's what we have here. I um, think the electronic version has the um, track changes and all that, if that's what we're looking for? Or is well, at this point, we're just looking for the previous yeah. version. Yes. Do you have that? The packet contained both. I believe it's oh, it did? Yeah. Did you yeah. 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 Okay. It did. Both what was referred by the city council and the changes recommended by you. So this is what, this is the current amendment version. Yeah, the one that references a special permit is the one that was referred by city council. So, so this is what we have amended, and this is what we should be reading into the record as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, uh, I think that most of the amendments, most of the changes were to that last section that you read here. Okay. Is that true, Carolyn? Yes. So, so all the changes are everything <coughs> is the same except for this area, which uh, uh, projects resulting in more than five acres of canopy. Okay, right. That's what these. So I will just ask: Is this acceptable to the planning board and uh, legislative matters that we just read the section that was significantly amended? amended? Yes. Okay. And the documents are in the record anyway, so yeah. they're in the record. Okay. The full documents, both of them, are yes. in the record. Okay. So what the section um, that Attorney Seawald is referring to that was significantly amended read, <coughs> excuse me, 
uh, projects resulting more than five acres of canopy removal shall only be eligible for special permit approval when all the following conditions are met. One, no work or disturbance occurs within 100 feet of any state protected bordering vegetated wetlands area within a riverfront area or within 200 feet of a certified or certifiable vernal pool. Two, no work or disturbance within any area on the Massachusetts Natural Heritage Program priority or estimated endangered species habitat. Three, no work or disturbance occurs on greater than one acre of state or federal prime agricultural soils. Four, no work or disturbance occurs on greater than one acre of slopes at or steeper than 20%. Five, when at least 50% of the property which the city identifies as having ecological or recreational value is donated to the city in fee or by a permanent conservation restriction and public right-of-way easement for mitigation. Six, the project must be carbon neutral over the first 10 years of operation. The applicant shall provide the following calculations. A, the total volume of trees to be removed provided by any independent certified forester. B, subtracting the estimated timber and replacement trees provided under the significant tree section of the zoning 10 years after planting. C, converting the net timber to be removed to short tons of carbon using research from the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science or other methodology approved by the permit granting authority. D, subtracting the carbon offsets, short tons of carbon, provided by the solar voltaic, photovoltaic project over 10 years of operation. E, if there is any net release of carbon within the above calculations, the applicant shall assign renewable energy credits, RECs, to the city to match or exceed said release of carbon. 4.7, within the area beyond the first five acres of canopy <coughs> removed, stumps for removed trees must this is the same, must remain in place and no excavation soil disturbance is allowed. Um, okay, so we have read that into the record. That is the previous version before it was amended. Um, actually, there was one more version, and that was the version that the Tree Commission put its endorsement behind. Mm -hmm. uh, that one just used the words timber instead of trees. Um. Did that not get changed? I'm not sh uh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, they removed that. So yeah, that's the version that got introduced to council. Because that was the skipped one of the changes. They skipped the paragraph. Submitted to the city council and the third. If somebody wants to put it in so the record, they're entitled to the yeah, really, we don't Right, so the, the, the amended version, which I'll go over in the explanation, okay. switches it from special permit to yeah, site yeah. plan. So, Ms. Yeah. Mish, you agree to uh, present us sure. explain this, yeah. the changes to us? Yeah. Um, first, I would like to just sort of um, give background and context to how we got to the proposed um, amendment that was introduced to council a couple of weeks ago, um, and then go through the um, internal reviews that we've done since it was introduced and why the then subsequent modifications are before you to consider um, recommending going forward. Um, so going back to 2011, the city adopted specific provisions for these um, solar installations. They were um, really focused on ground-mounted <coughs> solar, um, solar installations. Um, and at that time, there was a differentiation between rooftop and accessory to buildings. Um, <coughs> between those systems and ground-mounted that were accessory to buildings. So, um, if you're a homeowner or business that wanted to install ground-mounted systems that would supply energy just for your use on the site, um, would be treated differently from um, ground-mounted um, accessory systems that were slightly larger. And then um, sort of another tier was ground-mounted systems that were more utility scale over landfills and airports, which is still um, kept in this version as well. Um, and then special permits were created at that time for, again, utility scale systems that were not meant to provide energy for the 
um, use or other activities that were happening at the site, but really to, um, um, it's for the purposes of selling back to the grid or to other users. Um, at that time as well, there was a, a threshold in, um, adopted that no, um, at, at no point, even with special permit, could you do a clear cut of 25,000 board feet or greater. Um, and at no point uh, would there be any special permit eligible to be granted for this city's um, primary agricultural areas, the Special Conservancy District, all along in the 100-year floodplain along the Connecticut River. Um, the 25,000 board feet of timber threshold was based um, using the State um, Department of um, Agriculture threshold for obtaining a forest cutting plan, which is why we used that as, as a commercial timber value was originally adopted that way. That number was a little bit confusing for um, people to understand how much, how many trees that would um, entail um, for, for clearing. But anyway, since 2001, we've gradually tweaked some of these districts in which these systems are allowed, either by right or by site plan. We've changed um, setbacks. And um, we've also come back to revisit whether or not it's appropriate to <coughs> allow installations in the floodplain uh, on our primary agricultural um, soils and our food production area. So as that was reevaluated, we again heard from the community as well as um, the Ag, Ag Commission that they didn't want to sort of lift that restriction in the floodplain, that it was important to maintain those um, areas of agriculture for the city, and that it wasn't appropriate to sort of trade that off for, um, uh, for renewable energy production. Uh, also, <coughs> in that intervening time, we've had um, more and more interest in uh, by the solar developers to develop large-scale systems in the city. We've approved um, three now in the city, including over the city's landfill. Um, but there are also a couple of issues that those tweaks didn't address, uh, and so that's why we're here now. Um, primarily, there is um, a, I guess what we consider a loophole in that restriction about tree cutting in that someone could go and clear cut their property today and come in in three or four months or have a solar developer come in in three or four months um, and install a system on an area that's already been cleared. And so, you know, that doesn't really address the concern that the city had about trying to manage and create guidelines about how you do um, uh, tree clearing uh, for the purposes of creating solar installation. Um, the other uh, two things that came to light are that, you know, we want to continue to protect those um, agricultural lands, but what that means is we're restricting in the floodplain, and so that means that it puts pressure or, or it would um, mean that we need to have other locations where we can have these large-scale um, utility developments. So uh, we want to make sure we're creating a balance in the city about all, all the interests that we're trying to protect, um, forested areas, prime agriculture, but also uh, provide for <coughs> opportunities to create renewable um, energy production. The initial draft that was submitted that um, Councillor Klein just read um, maintained a special permit criteria. Um, and uh, but put um, additional conditions um, that applicants would need to meet. Um, and then, um, but after further reviewing with the city solicitor, um, concerns, m more concerns were raised about the um, statutory exemption that exists in the um, state relative to um, the municipals of municipality's ability to restrict the installation of solar um, development. That goes back to 1985 when the Zoning Act was amended to um, specifically say that, the, that municipalities can't prohibit these systems, solar system, solar installation systems, 
um, and can't unreasonably regulate them to the point that it effectively um, creates a ban on these installations. Back in 1985, I think it's pretty um, generally agreed upon that that was focused for um, building installations and roof systems that would support the on-site uses because the technology wasn't there and nobody was really building these large-scale utility type of solar installations. But nevertheless, the laws haven't changed to catch up to where we are with technology now. And it's clear throughout the state that um, there's an open question about whether municipalities now with this new introduction of the type of solar installations that we have, um, you know, we've got small scale and then medium scale, some people refer to them, and then we have these large scale five, um, you know, megawatt systems that are definitely different than what was envisioned in 1985. But after reviewing that and knowing that nobody in the Commonwealth has really tested this, that there haven't been court challenges that have been decided about this issue, about whether cities can actually say no to any of these, um, we felt um, upon the city solicitor's recommendation that it was prudent not to put the city of Northampton in the path of potential um, legal challenge with um, these restrictions that were uh, in the proposed amendments that were going to, uh, that were introduced to city council. And further, um, upon the recommendation <coughs> of the city solicitor, um, the recommendation was to, that, that the previous 2011 language was, could probably not withstand challenge or that it didn't make sense to test that um, at any rate. So that's what led to the proposed amendments to what was introduced originally back two, three weeks ago. Um, and the, so the primary changes are to eliminate the special uh, permit prohibition on the 25,000 board feet of timber that would be removed um, and make that um, create a threshold that's more understandable to most of the public. So base it on the acreage of trees removed, and, but create a site plan review process by the planning board that clearly says these systems are by right, but you need to follow these criteria. Um, so it changes it to a board foot calculation to five acres of tree clearing and creates standards for review um, for these large systems um, that would then require that at least 50% of the land be um, protected from development for the duration that the systems are in place, which we think are probably, there's a lifespan of 20 years maybe. Um, and so that the, the other portion of the property that would be cleared for such a system would stay undeveloped, sort of untouched for that time. Um, and that um, the um, stumps should remain in place on site, again, to address the concern about um, maintaining that carbon in the ground because we know from more recent information that in New England carbon is sequestered primarily in the ground um, and so if you're pulling out grading clear cutting land and pulling out all those stumps that's when you're going to get I guess most of the carbon release so by putting in a restriction saying everything has to stay in place and you put the mounts on top of those stumps then that's um, provide some element of protection. Um, the, um, <coughs> the reason that the other special permit criteria have been, are proposed to be deleted from that initial introduction as it relates to the um, clearing within the jurisdiction of, of the 200 foot riverfront or 100 foot buffer is that that area is also under the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission as it relates to the Wetlands Protection Act as well as our local uh, wetlands ordinance. And so um, uh, Solicitor Seawald has um, made, um, has suggested that the planning board can't really override it and um, work in the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission because that's the Conservation Commission's 
jurisdiction is to determine whether there's an impact within those buffer zone areas that are regulated under the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, so again, that sort of falls into that um, category of um, an additional burden that may be challenged under that section um, 40A, uh, sorry, chapter 40A, section three exemption for solar. So that um, whole section about um, um, wetlands buffer zone clearing was, was taken out. Um, and then the other pieces, there's some small um, tweaks in the rest of the language that we feel will make it um, a little bit easier for systems that we want to encourage. So over parking lots, over landfills, and at airports, which are pretty straightforward. Um, that would propose, it would just be a staff level review as opposed to planning review. And I think that um, that pretty much covers the basis for the, for the change and the kind of uses for that. Can I answer any questions if you want before you open it up? Um, why don't we hear from Attorney Seawald and then okay. we'll um, sure. hear from the public yeah. and then we'll okay. question. My name is Alan Seawald, I'm the City Solicitor for North <coughs> and And um, I, um, I, I want to begin just by reading the, the protection that is in the Zoning Act, the state zoning law that protects solar uses. It says, no zoning ordinance or bylaw shall prohibit or unreasonably regulate the installation of solar energy systems or the building of structures that facilitate the collection of solar energy except where necessary to protect the public health, safety, and welfare. In terms of zoning, the term necessary to protect is a very stringent standard. Okay? It's not like normal zoning where we want things to be aesthetically pleasing or harmonious with its surroundings or proper ingress and egress. This is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare. It's a very strict standard. Now, I agree uh, that this having been, this being decades old, it is completely out of date and it should be revised um, however, if we know that, the legislature also knows that, and they've chosen not to revise this, and so we're stuck with this, and this is what we have to apply. Now, I mean, I, I'm city solicitor, but I've also represented solar uh, companies, and um, most solar goes, goes on farmland. That's where most of the solar uh, arrays end up, because in order to do solar, you need flat open space. <coughs> and what is what flat open space is out there really of, of several acres, of numerous acre size, other than farms. <laughs> and so um, I always get pushed back because the people who are wanting to protect <coughs> agriculture are always up in arms about it. The legislature has put a heavy thumb on the scale in favor of solar. It has to go somewhere, and in order to <coughs> prohibit it, we have to be ready to show and prove that it's necessary to, to regulate and restrict and, or prohibit it in order to protect the health, safety, and welfare. And I'm, I'm sure the planning board recognizes this as a very stringent standard. So when I read the first um, iteration that came to me, uh, I, I never saw the one from the, uh, uh, from the tree committee, but I said, no work or disturbance occurs within 100 feet of any state uh, protected bordering vegetated wetland. Well, I mean, I can get a, an order of conditions from a conservation commission saying that that's perfectly fine. How can I also say that it's necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare if I can go to the conservation commission and get a, a permit to work in that area? Um, it, it cuts strongly against any notion that working in a, you know, within 100 feet of a bordering vegetated wetland it imperils the health, safety, and welfare of the people of this city. Um, and so there were numerous um, of those types of conditions preceded to getting a special permit, which I told Carolyn I didn't think was supportable under the very strict standard. Um, and so that's when um, Carolyn revised it, and that's how we got to where we are today. <coughs> I, I get the need to protect the canopy, I, I, I get all that. I get the need to protect farmland. I also get the need 
to uh, find alternate means of production of energy other than fossil fuels. <coughs> These are, are all laudable goals and they're all competing in this arena. And, um, and uh, I feel that the city is somewhat constricted uh, in what it can do uh, to put the heavy thumb on the trees when the legislature has already put the heavy thumb on, uh, on the solar. And that's how, from my perspective, we got here today. Now, I'm not saying that there is no way to, no other way to balance these. And I'm not sure that you need to do it in five acres. If you wanted to, you could require a study and a report from some expert, some considered <coughs> scientist who can tell you exactly how much carbon sequestered carbon is going to be released from these trees and exactly how much fossil fuel will be printed. Um, but that's on a case-by-case -case basis. You can't just say over five acres. I, I don't even know why we're doing that at five acres. I don't know why we're not doing that at two acres or doing that any tree cutting. Um, you could do that. What I'm saying is you just can't pick five acres and say four and a half acres is, doesn't pose the same threat to the health, safety, and welfare is five acres. So let's be very specific about what we're doing because we're going to have to prove <coughs> that the benefit from the solar is overridden by the detriment from the cutting of the trees in this particular case. That's where I am on this. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we don't, we didn't do a sign up sheet, so if you want to raise your hands, we'll just go through the room, starting over here, um, and please feel free to approach the podium. It's important to do that just so that the camera picks you up. Um, so who would like to <coughs> offer public comment on this? I'd be happy to. <laughs> Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Lily Lombard. Um, I'm gonna wear two hats. Can I live at 39 um, Monroe Street. It just, we we can um, stretch, and you don't necessarily have to provide your exact address if you don't want. But okay. we would like you to um, say where you're from generally. Okay. Uh, I'm, so your name and where you're yes. from. Yes. Lily Lombard, Northampton resident. I'm gonna wear two hats in my comments. The first is as chair of Northampton's Public Shade Tree Commission, and the second is a private citizen and a tree and climate activist. Um, in terms of uh, a, 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 an official statement as chair, it's, it's very straightforward. Um, this I information came to us on Friday <coughs> that there were substantive changes to the draft ordinance that Carolyn presented to us and that we voted on to endorse on January 2nd. Um, and, um, and therefore, uh, in order to put our stamp of approval on a new draft, we need to be able to deliberate. As a, as a board, and we can't do that except for in an open meeting. So um, here, here's my official statement. I learned on Friday, February 8th, that um, the ordinance relative to large-scale ground-mounted solar arrays has undergone significant changes after being reviewed by the city solicitor, and is therefore materially different from the draft the Public Shade Tree Commission reviewed and endorsed with recommended language change at our January 2nd meeting. Now that the draft has materially changed, in order to meet as a commission to consider the changes, which we can only do during an open meeting, we respectfully request an additional month to get better informed and reconsider this revised ordinance before we affirm our support for it. <coughs> All right. Um, as a private citizen, um, I wanted to affirm my support for both solar production and tree canopy pr protection. Um, I, I was informed by both what Carolyn shared and Alan, and I think that um, Alan's remarks about uh, the arbitrariness of, um, of, of, of five acres, considering five acres is really well taken, and that um, this makes me feel like we need to step back and, and, and start all over and look at really what we're asking and to get some very specific measurements of how we're going to evaluate each case. Um, I will say that um, in full respect for your interpretation of Chapter 40, um, the Zoning Act, um, I went to the Department of uh, Energy uh, Resources site 
and they acknowledge that there's uh, there, there lacks some clear clarity regarding the interpretation of this law. Um, and one of the things they um, they mention, which I'll quote, um, they say regarding large scale ground mounted solar energy systems, DOER is unable to provide a definitive interpretation of unreasonable regulation under Chapter 40A, Section 3. Uh, they later go on to say that. Um, this approach recognizes that some communities uh, presently require a special permit to install a large-scale ground-mounted solar energy system and or restrict such facilities to certain districts. Given the plain language of the statute, DOER believes that it is prudent for communities to allow large-scale ground-mounted solar energy systems somewhere in the community. At the same time, these systems are by definition large, even if they have relatively benign impacts compared to other land uses. Thus, a higher degree of municipal control over the location and permitting of such systems may not be inconsistent with Chapter 40A, Section 3 mandate that regulations be reasonable and necessary to protect public health, safety, and welfare. And I'm happy to submit this um, as part of the record. Um, so what I'm hoping is that we um, we take a little time, <laughs> um, we kind of go uh, go back to um, to the drawing board in drafting an ordinance that, that we hope does both uh, allow for solar production some appropriate places in our city while also um, protecting the services that trees provide, not only carbon sequestration, which is a really important one and, and easy to measure, but there are other pretty measurable benefits to trees that both enhance public health and welfare, and those should be um, considered as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. <coughs> My name is David Reutman, and I live at uh, 575 Bridge Road in Florence, and uh, I'm representing the work group of Climate Action Now that's focused on farming, uh, forests, and food systems. And um, one of our advisors is uh, uh, Professor William Muma, who you may have heard of. He's uh, one of the leading climate scientists um, in the world. He just happens to live in Massachusetts. Um, and uh, it, it was really... Uh, timely when Mr. Sewell pointed out the, uh, the uh, issue around the five acres and the opportunity for um, more precise science on this because uh, Professor Muma is, is working on this question right now. We're not the only community in Massachusetts uh, dealing with this issue. So I'm going to re uh, just uh, briefly read, I'm, I'm going to keep it to three minutes uh, or less. Just a few comments from an e email, a recent uh, email from Bill. And, and by the way, Bill um, <clears throat> was lead author on several sections of the, uh, uh, sorry, several different IPCC, Inter International Panel on Climate Change, uh, several different uh, releases of that. So he's very tied into um, the idea, more than an idea, the, the um, uh, requirement that um, we've got 12 years basically um, and uh, to, to um, change the way we do things so that our greenhouse gas emissions are significantly uh, lowered. Okay, um, and the other thing quickly I want to point out is that it's of course entirely appropriate that a primary focus of this meeting is the legal um, focus. I, that's very quite appropriate, but I just want to point out that that's not the only perspective um, that you as city council and we as citizens um, have on um, having our community uh, be continuing to be a strong and vibrant community. Okay, so here are those uh, comments, um, and um, to, to cut to the chase, uh, these comments really strongly suggest um, what we really just um, advocated, which is um, slowing this down and taking enough time to really get it right. Um, okay, so a, a ma major point, and something Bill has been uh, emphasizing in recent talks, 
is new science, new knowledge uh, about um, the correlation between the age of trees um, and how much carbon they sequester. And I'm not going to get into the details, you know, it's a multiple regression, lots of variables, blah, blah, blah. But there's a new understanding of how important older trees are to keep in the ground, okay? So that's the first point he made. Um, and, the, and actually, I'll be really quick because Lily already talked about that the other points that he makes is in, in this correspondence is that when you're considering solar versus trees, um, you're really looking not just at what uh, trees are contributing uh, to carbon sequestration, um, but all the other things that, that, that trees um, uh, do, in, including the water um, evap evaporation, lowering, lowering the urban heat island effect, um, and um, cleaning the air and the water, pollutants, and on and on and on. So uh, I think all these points and, and uh, the fact that um, Dr. Muma is working on this issue right now um, and that can really have a more precise bearing on what we're considering, I think this all uh, strongly supports um, um, proceeding with all um, due care. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> Although I'm a strong supporter of conservation and environmental issues, I also realize too that reality has shown its face continuously as change takes place. And you will always be faced with a balance in life. It will never change. Constant rebalancing, meaning that we give up some good to accomplish some other end. It may not be favorable, but we have to balance our programs. And we have to decide whether we want solar energy or we want fossil fuel. Gotta make a decision. If you want solar energy, you're gonna be building on crop land. Maybe where somebody raises potatoes, or raises cattle, or there's a standing woodlot. Which are you going to give up? You really don't want to give up any of them. But we have to have a balance. If you want furniture, if you want a house, somebody has to cut down some trees. That's the only way. So being realistic with the approach. And uh, uh, I'm suggesting <clears throat> that your ordinance be such that it will be usable to the solar people who want to get involved in that industry in your community. And the community benefits also because there's a payment in lieu to the city for the facilities, of course. The larger facility, the more the city benefits. But if you have small units, they're scattered all over the place, all over the city. Is that what you want? Or would you rather have a medium operation or a larger operation here, there, and that sort of thing, like where factories are built? They're not all over the place. They're in certain locations, and, and other areas are free of that. So. With solar farms, they can't go everywhere. So you don't have to figure they're going to be next door to you, and they're not going to be in town. They're going to be kind of on the outskirts where there's some space. And they all require space. I'm recommending, I've gone, I'm no solar technician at all. I'm just a supporter and promoter of solar uh, programs. And I'm, I'm proposing that the city make it usable for solar people. And I'm suggesting that in regards to uh, space, that they allow 
the cutting of 20 acres of timber in order to put a moderate, not a large, but a moderate program if necessary. That would allow for about a three megawatt unit. That's not a very big unit, it's a moderate unit. Uh, now, I'm not, I can't go into the details of uh, the, uh, the uh, methodology of it. I'm not that talented. I, I don't understand it. The canopy, the board feet, uh, the carbon programs that they have, those are experts that can give you that information. I'm coming from you from a, the other end of usability and need. And a uh, 20 unit, a 20 uh, acre clearing <coughs> would give you about a three megawatt unit, like I say, moderate, that would be usable for public uh, purposes. And uh, if it were adequately adequately uh, arranged so that there was screening and so forth uh, and accommodated uh, environmental issues and so forth, I would think would be a compliment to the community or any community. And I don't see that as being unreasonable. I see it as being a reasonable approach uh, to doing what we're all after, and that is reducing fossil fuel consumption. Now, yeah, there's a write-off there. Uh, you lose some forest uh, uh, area, but what have you gained? You gained the, uh, the promise of solar energy, and uh, that's long-lasting in the benefit of the city for, uh, I'll call it taxes. So I submit that uh, you give further study to the proposal and work out things with your technicians as to the technical terms of how this could work. But basically, it should work. It should work. It should not be a hindrance to the community. And the trade-off would be clean air, clean water, and so forth, as opposed to a patch of woodlands. Now, not many woodlands are going to be taken under any conditions. There aren't that many. And the city owns so much of it anyway that uh, it seems like a reasonable approach to me. And uh, so I suggest that, uh, that you use that as a guide with the fact that, that solar people can uh, crown prune trees in the perimeter to allow for the maximum sun exposure for their programs that would help them. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yes, please. Oh, there's someone behind you, but... Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Garrett Stover, 55th Fairview Avenue. Um, I'm a, I control three solar systems uh, family property, so definitely alternative energy advocate. Um, my original uh, comments to you were going to be that you weren't protecting enough under this ordinance. Um, I understand the constraints that the state has left in place, um, but I would point out a few things. It's sounding as if a quantitative analysis of the net carbon uh, offset uh, for any uh, non-site servicing solar project might be something you could get away with. Um, I'm also intrigued that there are constraints on uh, solar installations relating to aesthetic buffers that don't seem to be a problem um, under your interpretation. If that's the case, then why aren't other um, concerns that don't relate directly to somebody perhaps getting a solar panel dropped on their head. Uh, why aren't those uh, admissible? I'll be very curious to see what communities in the eastern part of the state that are very wealthy, that have a lot of people that don't want to look at solar panels, mm. when they start getting into the action, 
and he's very interesting to see what sorts of challenges and frankly what sorts of courage communities have. I would much rather see Northampton continue to um, uphold the commitment to environmental <coughs> quality and natural resources that the city has uh, spent a great deal of time and money on. If you look at the western part of the, the city, uh, it's a magnificent portfolio of conservation land and private woodland. It would be a tragedy to lose, to lose that. Mm -hmm. Lastly, I want to point out that uh, I've been digging around a little bit on some of the solar companies' uh, websites. We're talking private equity here. Okay. Um, yes, there as a uh, ancillary of <coughs> the business activity investment that they're doing, there is something great coming out of it. But these people do not care about your community. They will clear cut as many acres as they possibly can. We're talking the 8% return, annual return on your investment. Sounds pretty sweet to me. Um, the company that did the Park Hill proposal, that portfolio has now been sold twice in the last few months. Um, I don't know if you remember the private uh, the mortgage equity uh, situation, but I think that's the level of investment interest at this point. So stay awake and please do whatever you can. Thank you, Mr. Silver. <coughs> uh, my name is Amy Meltzer. I live on Olive Street in Northampton. Um, I have some notes, but not really sure. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm here as a concerned citizen, and I'm here as a parent of two children who are growing up in Northampton and on this planet. And um, when I received the notice, I'm on the planning board notice, and when I saw these big changes, I was like, oh my gosh, this. This feels huge. It's really surprising to me that this is the first I've heard about such a significant change to uh, the protections that are in place for trees. And um, I think I always come at, at big decisions around the city and how land is used. And let, let's try to ensure the public voice as much as possible, because sometimes it's those of us in the public who catch the small things that might be missed. Um, and, and that's why the special permit process seemed like such a great fit here because it allows for that public voice to sometimes notice the things that might get missed because of those of us who are you know, looking closely at one small thing instead of those of you who are tasked at looking kind of a big macro issue. Um, what I want to say is this feels like a really, really big decision um, to allow kind of clear cutting unlimited amount of acreage for solar arrays that last, I heard, we estimate 20 years. Um, 20 years is like nothing in the life of a tree, right? Like to, to cut down acres and acres for 20 years of benefit feels very short-sighted. Um, I agree that we have to, there's, there's not, doesn't seem to be a clear, um, clear winner sort of in this question between the value of solar energy versus the value of trees. But I think the elephant in the room is that like what we really need to do is figure out how to reduce our consumption, not just continually grab more ways to make more power, whether it's clean power, renewable power, not renewable power. Um, but, I, but I do want to urge us to find out whatever we can do within the limits of the law to um, keep the public voice and to allow for a special permit. Um, a couple other things I wanted to bring up. I did just a little research on Friday. Um, and I, I thought there were some interesting examples that maybe, you know, I, 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 I am assuming that this is not going to get approved tonight, but it's going to go back to the Public Shade Tree Commission, and, and it will take some time. Um, it was really interesting to read to me about some somewhat neighboring towns. Um, New Marlboro spent about a year working on their solar, uh, revising their solar policy. They worked really closely with a planner from Berkshire Planning. Um, and just adopted things in the last year that do do maintain a special permit in certain places on certain sizes. Um, Townsend Mass looks like what they did was they did pull back. They looked at the law and said, we're not sure we're in compliance. And they pulled back some of their special permit requirements, but not all of them. And all they can say is now an attorney and someone with great faith in Alan Seawald 
um, but did, they had this thing on the top that said, approved by the Attorney General. So, so there was some conversation that took place. So, so I would love to see what can we learn from these other towns? What experts can we bring in to guide us in this process so that instead of just sort of um, going with the version that was reactive, um, that we're proactive with a new version that maybe takes some time to consult experts. Um, let me see if there's anything else I wanted to say. Diligence, uh, where, the, where the experts, I said that. Yeah, I guess the, I had two other things. One is that I did, um, I reached out to Joe Comerford's office about this and I, I would love to see what we can do to you know, the state to think about this. and. But it was funny because her primary staff person said, well, what do you suggest? And I was like, you don't ask me why. I don't know anything. I don't know what I suggest, but I suggest we look at this. Um, the only other thing, I, I'm curious. I don't know if we're allowed to have question and answer, but I would be interested at some point to hear why you think not a single one of the communities that has special permits in place, why hasn't it been tested? Like, it's a, I'm just curious, so I think that might be informative. And that's all. Thanks. Hi, I'm Rebecca Nymark from Columbus Avenue in Northampton, and um, I just want to say that I think it would be counter to um, the public health, safety, and welfare if in clear-cutting trees to create a solar array, we release more carbon than we can save through the solar energy. So um, I encourage the board to slow down and just try and find a way to protect the health of our community and our future. Thanks. Thank you. Who else would like to speak? Hi, my name is Nyla Morera. I'm a resident of North Clinton, um, and I'm here as a private citizen. I also teach at Smith College. Um, I am in support of all of those who uh, spoke in favor of slowing down and considering um, new ways that we can retain forested lands. I don't see any reason why forested lands should be lower on our uh, priority list than farmland, um, considering how many benefits uh, forests are responsible for, as many people have already mentioned. Um, uh, carbon sequestration is just one part of that puzzle. Um, and as we know, it's, 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 it's not clear whether forests can go head to head with, with solar in terms of um, their benefit in terms of climate. However, trees, as we know, uh, provide improved air quality um, for uh, residents of, of areas with trees. They have lower levels of cortisol and stress hormones. Green space across the United States is in decline. Um, the trees filter groundwater, they lower air pollution. I think I might have said that already. Um, and I think the, the gentleman's point who mentioned um, that solar is really a, a private equity thing uh, mm -hmm. is very well taken. I think that if we're really being intentional about where we place solar, we want not only to um, uh, be cognizant of that, but also to recognize that we can, by our regulations, provide further incentives to have people put solar in places where it's more appropriate, um, like uh, just to counter some of the other figures that were here today, there's 125 megawatts of solar capacity atop municipal buildings of just buildings uh, in Massachusetts, um, municipal buildings in cities greater than 100,000 people. The city of New Bedford alone put 16 megawatts of solar on top of their municipal buildings. So when we're thinking about clearing 20 acres of forest land for three megawatts of solar, um, the, the comparison there is, is I think, pretty obvious. Um, uh, and I think that it's, it's, it's important for us to state that solar has appropriate places where it can belong. Um, there are new technologies coming on board and they're not really ready yet, like solar shingles or solar roads, which hopefully we'll eventually move to. But in the meantime, as was mentioned, trees have a really, really long lead time to actually get them back. Um, so short 
short-sighted, near-term choices to chop them down will have really long-term consequences in terms of their availability in our community for all of the benefits that they offer. So I highly encourage slowing down. I think um, the, the comments about other municipalities that address this issue are, are uh, really appropriate. Um, and I hope we can find a solution that will protect our forest and lands. Thank you. Thank you. Nathan, I'm the 24 Massasoit Street in Northampton, and I didn't intend to speak, but I think that this is, we all got to do Loraxes in this time. Um, I just looked up on the web, it was really simple, the public health uh, importance of trees, and this is what I came up with. They produce oxygen, they intercept our airborne particulates, and reduce smog, enhancing a community's respiratory health. Um, they access to trees, green spaces, and parks promotes greater physical activity and reduces stress while improving the quality of life in our cities and towns. Urban landscaping, including trees, helps lower crime rates. Studies show that urban vegetation slows heartbeats uh, lowers blood pressure and relaxes brainwave patterns, and girls with a view of nature and trees at home score higher on tests of self-discipline, whatever that means. Um, <laughs> but I think that we all know that, that, that trees do more than just sequester carbon, which is really important. If you read, as I do, uh, the latest climate literature and some of the frigging harebrained schemes that are out there that people are trying to make money off of to sequester carbon because we, they know that we cannot reach the cuts and in emissions that we actually have to make. Um, and we have trees there that do it for us and have been doing it for us for eons. And so I think that w I, I agree totally with the slowdown. I agree with, I agree with the idea of being willing, and I know, Alan, this just puts a lot in your lap, the possibility that if we move forward, we may have to push those legislatures, and we may have to, to face something in the court, but it's, it's, our, it's our communities and our children's future. So thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. <laughs> Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? Give it just a few seconds so you can work up your courage if that's what you're trying to do. <laughs> Hi, I'm John Cohen. I live on Island Road in Northampton. I also hadn't planned to speak. There's one of these factor that we're overlooking that we're not only in a climate crisis, we're in a crisis of natural biodiversity on the yes. planet. Yes. Trees and forests are primary habitat, of course, for people, creatures who are not humans. Every time you cut down a tree, I, I can't imagine how many insects' lives are ended. You know that we're perhaps living in an era when the insect population is going extinct. I don't need to say any more. We must save all our wild spaces. You must give them back to the animals whose lives support our lives. The giant web of life of which we are a minor part requires that humans do what they can now, not to destroy piece by piece by piece the web of life that supports us. Thanks. Anybody else? Okay. Any last minute hands raised? No? Okay. Um, so this is the chance for the planning board members and the legislative matters committee members to post questions um, or if you have any responses that you'd like to share. Um, let's go. <laughs> I have a question. So <coughs> this uh, under is enough to you. That's all right. Okay. So this came to us uh, upon recommendation of the mayor and the public shade tree committee. 
and yet we've heard a number of the folks from the Public Shade Tree Committee asking, asking for it to be returned to them is what I'm, what I'm hearing. Um, is, is that what I'm hearing? So, the, so even though this comes to the City Council upon the recommendation of the Mayor of the Public Shade Tree Committee, mm -hmm. the Public Shade Tree Committee no longer recommends the... <coughs> That's correct. We, can, we don't recommend this version. We haven't discussed it. Okay. Okay, and so what we have is the amendments that um, uh, planning and uh, the solicitor took from that mm -hmm. and presented to us as an amended version, right? right. Well, where did this so this so proposed? right? We we yeah. propose modifications based on evaluation of the legal standing. Mm -hmm. um, I I know the chair from the tree com um, public shade tree committee had asked to have it pulled back. They haven't had a meeting since then, so as a um, you know, as a committee, they, I don't think they've decided anything. Oh. Um, but um, on this latest version, um, the reason for the timing, which you all can sort of consider um, holding back, which makes sense to have more evaluation, it may take a long time to understand um, language or research that might be out there. The only Negative to that, which I would re recommend moving forward as a temporary measure, is that there is the ability for trees to be cut anyway and for permits to come in for um, solar installation. Um, so no matter what you do now, because there's this loophole that um, can be used to accomplish um, this. So in the interim, there may be an opportunity to provide some measure of um, review and um, framework for installation um, while at the same time doing more research. So we can just close the loophole right now and then move and then? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Merson, you had wanted to. <coughs> um, I just have a couple thoughts or questions on, on the on the issue of it's brought up by several people that uh, someone's going to make money, uh, maybe a lot of money, I have no idea, on building solar arrays. That doesn't strike me as bothersome. As long as there's a public benefit and as long as they comply with all of the restrictions and requirements that are imposed, I could care less if they make money. Um, I think the real question, which I have no um, insight into, is whether an acre of trees produces more ecological benefit than an acre of solar panels. I mean, that's, isn't that really the question? I, um, and I, I don't think we can move forward until we get some real solid information as far as what the answer is. Um, but that's that's really the core of the question. Um, because it's not like, I mean, there's kind of an implicit assumption by the <laughs> members of the group that um, trees are better. And that may be true, it may be false, I don't know. Um, so uh, then uh, I guess, if a couple of months or a month of delay in adopting the ordinance will give us more insight or information on these questions, I, I personally don't see any problem of doing that. Thank you. <coughs> Can you tell us what other cities ha are legally doing? To not at the top of my head, but I, but I will <coughs> address, if I may, uh, I'm Chair, um, the issue of the special permit. And I apologize to Carolyn if she came away from our conversation saying that special permit isn't allowed. A special permit <coughs> can be applied, and I would say that other uses that are protected in Section 3 specifically say no special permit may be required for this use. And so, I recognize that a special permit could be required, and I think the planning board members will recognize what I'm about to say. But when you strip out all of the discretion because of the state law, 
you essentially are turning special permits into site plan review. If you can only deny the special permit in or, where it's necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare, that is the essence of site plan review. And so you can call it a special permit. I don't have a problem calling it a special permit as long as all the criteria for issuing the special permit go to that issue necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare. And that's what I tried to get across to Carol and didn't, you know, I understood and I didn't question why she removed the special permit because conceptually and functionally, it's the same. So, Ms. Mish, can you respond to that, to the, okay. just the thinking behind your removal of the special permit? Yeah, I mean, it was exactly that. So once you, you know, if the issue is, um, I, I think it's the issue of once you, um, you're held to that standard, it may as well be a site plan review because that's what you're issuing. And there's an, there's also this sort of public perception because that's stand, it's typical that special permits allow the planning board lots of discretion. And so if we're advertising in the zoning as something special permit, but in fact it's very a very stripped down limited special permit, then it's sort of um, like truth in advertising. You know, let's let's say it let's Call make it a site plan, right. call it what it is, instead of putting it in this other category. So, I mean, that was the real reason why the modification. And, you know, just the, the same, I think, as um, Lily pointed out, the Department of Energy has said, and people have said it all over all the listservs in Massachusetts, that it's just not, I mean, yes, there are communities that have special permits, but it hasn't really come to a head in a, in a court challenge. So. We just don't know. Um, and so, you know, I think the idea is to get, um, you know, to close that loophole. But also, yes, we want to understand what those, and balance those impacts are. And maybe we can do, you know, find the answers to those questions. I think it will take um, a lot more research. And I think the threshold of five acres is definitely, it's a number. There's no magic to it. We're trying to make it easier to understand that 25,000 board feet, which again was pulled out of a threshold that's based on part of agricultural forest um, cutting plans, and um, making an easier number to come up with. It could be three acres, it could be four acres, it could be five acres. Five is an easy number to work with. That There's no magic in that, though. Thank you. One, one more. Okay. Um, somebody also mentioned that um, you know they saw towns with uh, with special permits and said approved by the Attorney General. I, just to be clear, cities don't get their ordinances approved by the Attorney General, towns get their bylaws approved by the Attorney General. And I've read almost every one of the Attorney General's approval on both wind and solar. And, um, and basically, uh, the caveat that the Attorney General issues with, with solar is, there's never been a case that's decided this, we, we don't know whether these are going to be reasonable regulations. We're not going to deny it, but you should really work with your city solicitor, your town council, to make sure that in a given case, you're not violating rights. And that's the way the attorney general <laughs> approves these. Um, so I wouldn't rely too much on attorney general approval as uh, suggesting what, you know, that we know what the rules are. Uh, uh, all, all Carolyn questions. All Carolyn questions. Because um, I'm not on the planning board, what is the status quo today? Um, so right now, there's a special permit criteria for um, um, for large scale solar um, installations. There aren't very many um, restrictions, but then there's an outright prohibition. It says in the language, it says in the text that um, under no circumstances, though, can more than 25,000 board feet. Of timber be removed for the purposes of installing this. There's no look back period for 12 months prior. There's no, um, there's um, um, <coughs> nothing that would allow you to do more than that. So in, for example, if someone came to our office and said, I'd like to do an installation on X piece of property, we uh, um, describe what the requirements are and we send them off to um, hire a forester to determine how much, um, how many board feet would require, would be required for removal before they come and even apply for a special permit. So just a now question, does that, in the spirit of the state legislation or is that overreach? Overreach? 
in a given case, I had no I, I had no idea what the com what, what the comparison between seven twenty seven thousand board feet and some undetermined size of a solar array. I had no idea. How would anybody know? Well, the statute says you can't unreasonably regulate. Unreasonably regulate. Would that be unreasonably regulated? How would I know? <laughs> how would anybody know? <laughs> no, seriously, how would anybody know if that's reasonable? Well, I guess somebody would know if we got sued and we lost, it would be unreasonable. But that has a It could be different and different. I mean, and what kind of trees are we talking about? I mean, I mean, it's all, it's okay. just, I mean, it's impossible to know. I mean, if you're talking old okay. forest growth, you're talking, you know, mm -hmm. who so, knows? So we don't know if the status quo passes muster or not. So, but with that status quo, we were motivated to then need to modify it, which is what's in front of us now. Right. And what improvement was this to make over that? What was the rationale? Um, to address the um, potential opportunity that people could have to go ahead and clear cut more than that anyway and not um, get any approvals for that prior to coming forward for a permit. That was primarily the reason. Mm -hmm. And then also to to um, create a framework um, by which um, the board could review situations that might be appropriate to have um, um, clear cut more than whatever that number is. If it's 25,000 board feet or if it's four acres or five acres. So, so the, propo the initial proposed amendment was to give more leeway to the planning board to be able to allow these things to be created yeah. and clear more space for them. Right. So it was to liberalize Right, and but within the, the confines of regulations and not allow things to come in through the back door. Okay. Yeah. And then um, the list of conditions got shortened because the solicitor said, I think this is overreach. You've right. got to simplify that. So that's how we wound up with the shorter list of conditions. Right. So the desire to amend the status quo was to, through the permitting process allow for these to happen with review where they were prohibited by the current regulation. Right. So the goal is all along to be able to compromise and let these things happen. Right. And we are now at a pretty short list because of the state statute. Right. Okay. Um, so until we make these changes, it's hard under any circumstances to install these. Um, correct unless um, someone comes forward as what happened with the CEB project off of Ryan Road, where the land was clear cut before the was, applicant came forward. Right, so, right. but no, so, so the f purpose for this is to allow a process with review where you can do some clear cutting to put these in. Otherwise, you have to find a place that's currently open space and clear so that you don't have to disturb the trees. Right. Yeah. Right. All right. And is there a particular time frame for this? Is, is there a... I, no, I mean the only, the, the, so once we saw that the, um, what uh, took place on Ryan Road, we thought, well, it makes sense to move forward with the change sooner rather than later so that um, the, um, so that we can close that so that we're not you know, caught off guard by Carolyn, just so that people um, in the audience understand, maybe people don't know about the Ryan Road situation, you can just yeah. provide us a short piece of background. Sure. So, um, there was a proposal for um, a, a five megawatt system um, in the, uh, as part of the reuse of the Willard Gravel Bank off of Ryan Road, and um, that entailed more than 25,000 board feet of removal so the project wouldn't have been able to go forward. They ended up removing over 100,000 board feet of timber um, but before they applied for the permit. So um, it was the property owner who had the clearing done and then the solar developer came and applied and so the trees were gone so they didn't fall under that provision um, that um, could have otherwise been place or addressed. They still need to do tree replacement because the tree replacement ordinance has a 12 month look back, mm -hmm. but the restriction on the cutting doesn't have a 12 month look back. Mm -hmm. And how, how <coughs> what is, what's the status of Park Hill Road 
relative to the current ordinance? The Park Hill Road solar so installation? Yeah. So they had um, just under 25,000 board feet of clearing that they needed to So they got under the threshold yep. with that? Yep. Mm -hmm. And then there was hardly any clearing for the landfill site. Yeah. <laughs> You know, in a landfill. I think maybe three trees. Three trees. Yeah. Okay. Um, so again, for the timing of this, since there seems to be the interest for more discussion, is it compelling that we move in the next month, two months, three months? I mean, it's really all. I mean, I I think it makes sense to sort of understand the science better mm -hmm. and and understand what those thresholds might be. Is it two acres? Is it one acre? Is it you know five acres? But there's obviously a trade-off of not doing something now to because you can always come back and amend. Mm -hmm. So I I guess I hadn't really thought about it sort of the time. I mean I think if you took one or two months, that should be fine. <laughs> I don't think there are any um, new rounds of um, of um, um, SRECs that are coming up the state level yet. I think as soon as there are more that are issued from the state, there's going to be another push mm -hmm. to find locations. So it's hard to know when that um, you know pressure will be applied again. Mm -hmm. um, I think a couple of months is not. Three a months isn't an issue. I don't think so. Six months maybe. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Carolyn, just so I understand, if a project were to come forward that we're not expecting currently, if we have made any changes to the status quo, even if we were in the middle of discussion, the existing ordinance would apply. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Um, question, Carol. So under the, <coughs> the proposed rewording of the ordinance, could a developer come in and propose a project in the meadows or? No. So that, so the, um, w there's not a proposal to modify the absolute prohibition of development of the meadows, which is special conservancy. The reason why the, we don't think there's an issue with restriction in the meadows is that it's in the 100 year um, floodplain. And so that has a much um, greater, that, that, that relates back to the um, necessary to meet the <coughs> public health, safety, and welfare of the community because we, we don't even let new housing development happen in the floodplain. So it's, a, it's really a, a public safety issue installing new structures, if you will, in the floodplain. So where is that language? Would it be in 18.231? No, because else? it's already on the books. Mm -hmm. So we're uh, not yeah. proposing, uh, there's no proposal to amend okay. that. Okay. That will stay in place. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, just a timing question, because this is in public hearing now. Mm -hmm. um, when we ultimately close this public hearing and start the clock to for yeah. the rest of this ordinance, where are we in that? Just for everybody. So you have, once you close the public hearing, you have ninety days to make a decision. But if you don't close the public hearing, you're not starting that clock. Mm -hmm. There is a window at which point you have to make a decision from the time it was introduced. I can't remember the number off the top of my head. Do you know what it is? Yeah. It's some other number. Yeah, that's why I wanted to. I can't remember either. <laughs> but if you, continue it, if you continue it to a date and time certain, then um, it's still an open public hearing. So you should be okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is, Carol, is, do you have any notion of approximately how many board feet there are in an acre? I mean, I understand it depends on what kind of trees and yep. the age of the trees and so on. But any... So they that's the shine. problem is it's so dependent on the site and the location and what the species are. So in some cases it might be three acres, in other cases it might be five acres. So it, or it might be two acres. So it's really, because it's a completely different measure, right. it's, it's, the val it's the commercial value of the product, essentially, is the way it's. And that's, and, and it's spelled out that way because the Department of Agriculture has this whole forest cutting. It's the purpose is for forestry and and commercial timbering. So that's that's where the number comes from. So there could be that. board. I mean, board feet only relates to usable trees for commercial purposes. Yeah. If they're right. sort of weedy, new right. growth, whatever, right. then there's zero board feet. Right. Depends on the health of the trees, too, yeah. not just the type of tree. Yeah. Is yep. Is there room, I mean, 
we don't have to worry about property that the city owns because we're not developing that. I mean, how much, how much privately owned tree area are we talking about? And if it's a small amount, is it the type of thing that, that we could actually go and look at by acre to actually see what the land is worth relative to the trees that are there? You yeah. have to hire a forester, and so, and there's a, there are many acres of forest in there. I'd like to follow up on the procedural kind of uh, exploration here. So if we don't close this public hearing, um, and we leave ourselves kind of an open window in terms of um, by when we make a decision, what kind of uh, ordinance we do want to craft, I guess I'm kind of curious what what would that explore, exploration look like? Where would it sit? Who would carry out the kinds of research that we want um, done to have the kind of information we want to yeah. make to craft an ordinance that makes sense? Um, so I'm, you know, putting that out, I guess, to all of us here, and of course you. I mean, you know. yeah. I mean, we would do our best to provide the information that you would want. I mean, if, obviously, if it's a three-month window. You know, there's probably only so much we can get, and if the research is still ongoing, we're not going to get the, you know, it may, no matter what you decide, it may require the council to come back in a year when maybe new information um, comes out. So, and as you know, um, in Northampton anyway, zoning isn't static. In some towns it's really hard because you have to go to town meeting and it only happens once a year. In Northampton, we can make adjustments based on new information and we're doing that now with this with this ordinance you know we've tweaked it along the way since 2011 it hasn't stayed the same so. so i'm still curious though would it you know who would craft the questions we want to answer would it just be the sole responsibility of the planning department to um, do the research that is being asked for um, would it make sense to see <coughs> the city council committees to go back to the public shade tree commission to do their research yeah. I'm just trying to kind of conceptualize what it could look like for us to get all of the information we want in one place. Who formulates the questions? Who right. figures out how to answer the questions? Well, I mean, I think you all should um, maybe think about what questions you want answered based on public comment that you might want to include. We can certainly start down the path of research and if we need to pull in other people and certainly public shade tree committee wants to have another look at it, they would certainly be able to, you know, provide input. I think I think the idea would be to gather as many sources of that information as possible. Um, and but um, and you may not know all the questions you want tonight, let's say, but as through this process you might you might have another meeting. Let's say you continued it till your next meeting is March, let's say April. But in March you came back and just sort of had another conversation about what you wanted. Um, you know, you could um, give us feedback at that time. I, I'll let you go in a minute, but I just want to follow up here. I think there's one imperative that's fairly compelling, which is that the Public Shade Tree Commission is currently um, one of the sponsors, a yeah. co-sponsor with the mayor of this, and it, it doesn't make sense for us, I think, to move forward if we have a sponsor who's actually pulled back based on the amended version. So that's, to me, a compelling reason why we do need to slow this down. It needs to go back to this co-sponsor. But I'm also wondering if it would make sense to go to one of the um, <coughs> city services or city resources committees of the city council the to probably more than cities. You said well, that the chair of city services. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, I mean, if, if, you can, if you can justify the city services, that makes sense. Right. The community resources deals with land use. Because it does seem to me that we have to figure out who's going to kind of curate all the questions and, um, and then figure out how we're going to answer them if it just goes to the planning department or if there are other means. But I think Council Murphy wanted to address that. Okay, well, I do share your concerns that one of the sponsors is not comfortable with the current version because it was changed after they blessed it, and I think they do deserve another crack at it to either decide they can support it or they want their name off it if you don't like it. I mean, you can't really leave their names on there if they don't like it. And, and also from, I mean, the council legislative 
position. I wouldn't want to act on it. I mean, it's more the planning board's bailiwick. I don't think I'd want to act on it until the planning board re renders a decision. Do they support it or do they not support it? Because we're usually the last ones. And if it's going to go to community resources as well, the council wants to send it there too, then we should wait to hear back from there. But we're, we more or less in this committee deal with things once everyone else has weighed in. And certainly the planning board has more expertise in this than we do. And I would certainly I like that. Not true, <laughs> <laughs> but I'd certainly like them to weigh. I'd like the Public Shade Tree Committee to decide uh -huh. whether they buy in or not the current version. I'd like the planning board to decide whether they support it or not before we go anywhere. And if it's going to another city council committee to get their input and, and then do what we're supposed to do, which is sort of craft all these recommendations together and put something to council that is is as good as it can get for the council to consider. So that would be my take on it. So procedurally, if we, um, and Alan, this might be something you can help us figure out. Um, if we leave this public um, hearing open, does, does the um, planning board, does, does the planning board have the ability to vote on this? Thank Could you. they vote yeah, on this? The yeah. planning board is going to okay. continue to date certain for a next meeting on this. And that will be the notice of the hearing, and they can go forward. Yeah. So that information would come back to us, but we can, will still have it open for the city council to pursue any of these other avenues that we decide we'd like to mm -hmm. pursue. Okay. Well, so I guess I'm not clear on that. The, the legislative subcommittee opened up this public hearing as part of their council responsibilities and planning board didn't open up a public hearing. You know, it's a joint. She opened the joint so public hearing. So it's open for both yeah. boards. Right. Mm -hmm. For both boards, regardless of whether they meet again, so they can meet separately right. under the same yeah. open. Yeah. Okay. And obviously the five of you are the five. Yeah. Unless we have a on this one meeting. But even if the public hearing is still open, the planning board can go ahead and, and vote. Right. Yes. Okay. Because you would be voting separately anyway. Yeah. Right. Yes. Okay. This is a, I mean, I guess there's two things. One is that it seems like we need to s very soon put in some sort of look back period, and that's and that will just solve the immediate issue. Um, and I don't feel like we need to have a bunch of extra meetings for that. I mean, that we can agree and just put that in place. Um, and the other thing I I'm uh, I guess, and I'm not a lawyer, but it seems like there's two things that are being said here. One, nothing has been challenged, so no one knows. Well, if no one knows, then we can make whatever law we want until it's challenged. So I, I, I just don't really understand. I mean, I, I, mean, I guess, I, I mean, I don't understand why we go one way when the other way is perfectly good. I mean, let them challenge it, or not. I mean, you know, I mean, that's the whole point, you know, I, I just don't understand why we would, why, what's the point of going one way versus the other? Please. <laughs> I can tell you that my job no, is to prevent the city from getting sued. That's like pretty high up on the list. <laughs> okay, and if the city gets sued, I mean, I'm asking this in a you know, very, very legitimate way. What, what, if the city gets sued and the answer is have to change that, <coughs> we change it. No, but the, the answer to change it comes after probably about 50,000 legal expenses. Okay, so, so, that, but, so yeah. that's the answer. It's like we're potentially stepping away. I mean, that's, I mean in the very real world, we're, we are putting this law in place for a potential lawsuit that may happen no matter what. Certainly less likely to happen if we are you know, focusing on the statutory requirement and we are imposing requirements that are consistent with that statute, much less likely to get sued. But the problem is, is that no one seems to understand what the statute says other than there's a strict statement to it. We have some guidance on what reasonable regulation is because it also applies to educational uses and daycare uses and uh, agricultural uses. So we have some law, there, but the solar itself has never been challenged okay. so but we I mean it's not like we're we're in a vacuum okay so I would move that legislative matters continues this public hearing until our meeting on April 8th we're not, we're well we give them oh we're good we're, 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 oh, I see we're doing two months okay. we'll do two months and that would give 
the planning board and yeah. the planning department time to review this and, and hopefully in that time they could make a positive recommendation and our hearing would be open so we could still solicit new information at that point in time and get everybody a chance to come back and say we agree or we don't agree with the planning board. So that's why I would say April 8th. Uh, any discussion on that? So then, because uh, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, discussion on that. I'm sure. concerned that <laughs> two months might not be adequate mm -hmm. to do what we have to do. I think we have to have a little bit more discussion about how we imagine this unfolding, who we want involved, do we want to refer it to um, one of the committees. I just, I suspect that we will need a little bit longer than two months. Well, I, I would think that may well be the case, but we could continue it again. Yeah. It would let us, it's long enough to see if something happens, and council, I mean, we can't refer it to another committee, but council could at its next meeting, because right. we could clearly make a report as to what came up and could suggest that maybe council should send it somewhere else too. I think that's enough time to get a feeling for what the direction is, and do we need more time, or we just got to revisit it in two months. That's why I picked that day. Any other discussion from um, so we can vote on that now. Yeah, and, and this is just legislative matters. Right. The, not the planning board can do its own thing. Yes. Yes. Um, so all in favor of continuing until April, what's today? April 8th. Yeah. Aye. 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 So, and then you guys need to entertain a motion. So your dates could either be uh, February 28th, which is probably too soon, or March 14th is your March meeting, your first March meeting. And as the attorney stipulated, the five of us would need to be available at that point right. to be present. Or at least four of you. Yep. Or they could review the record. Okay. Yeah. I cannot do March 14th. You can't. Mm -hmm. um, does it make sense to go to February 28th? You can't do February 28th. I'm sorry. I thought you said March 14th. Right. I was just wondering if, if um, February 28th. <coughs> Or there's March 28th, too. I, I would propose March 28th, because okay. if I understand the Public Trade Committee, sh Shade Committee, they're going to come up with some information for us at the next public hearing, I would hope, mm -hmm. that they will gather also, and I would hate to only provide them That would be more time. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So March 28th, you could do 7 o'clock. We don't have anything else scheduled at this point, so if you wanted to do that, you could make the moves to do that. Yep. So that was the 28th? Yeah. So somebody should make a motion second. Go ahead, George. He's chair. I'm chair of the meeting. I'm oh. officially <laughs> there because there are already chairs. So. I could continue the hearing at 7 p.m. on March 28th. Where? Okay. Where? Uh, uh, in council chambers. Do I have second? All in favor of that motion? Thank you. It's unanimous. <coughs> Any opposed? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we are at a point, I think, where the planning board will separate off from us, or should we uh, close our meeting first? Nick? Well, I would, do we have anything more on our agenda? We have nothing else on our agenda. I, I suggested that we should leave and let them carry on their yeah. business, but because it is. Is oh, there a problem that you're posting over there? Yeah, we're going to go upstairs. So they are going to have to walk yeah. over there. Sorry. I wouldn't want to be 